What's on your radar, Brianna? Well, Robbie, let's check in on how the American political establishment is reacting to news that the International Criminal Court is pursuing arrest warrants against Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Israeli Defense Minister Yov Gallant, and three Hamas leaders for alleged war crimes. Voices as diverse as State Department spokesman Matt Miller, Senators John Fetterman, John Boozman, Tim Scott, and Joe Biden himself have all echoed the same talking point, that there should be no equivalence between Hamas terrorists in Israel. Let me be clear. We reject the ICC's application for arrest warrants against Israeli leaders. Whatever these warrants may imply, there is no equivalence between Israel and Hamas. Now, I agree. There should be no equivalence between Hamas terrorists and Israel. That's because Israel has killed exponentially more civilians, humanitarian aid workers, journalists, and children than Hamas not just since October 7th, but during the decades leading up to that date. Over 35,000 Palestinian lives lost since October 7th, three quarters of whom are women and children are on one side, 1,200 Israeli lives lost, 764 of whom were civilians on the other. Moreover, while it has no legal or moral right to kill civilians, as a force representing an occupied population, Hamas does have a right to armed resistance. While as an occupier, Israel has humanitarian obligations to the people of Gaza, which it has failed to satisfy. To the extent that one side should balk at any equivalency being drawn, it's just not at all clear to me that it should be Israel. Despite protest, uh, protestations about false equivalences, the ICC does not let Hamas off the hook or unfairly hold Israel to a higher standard. The ICC prosecutor says the warrant against Hamas leaders Sinwar Dai and Hania would be based on evidence that the three men were criminally liable for extermination as a crime against humanity, taking hostages, and torture, rape, and other acts of sexual violence in the context of captivity. At the same time, the crimes against Netanyahu and Gallant include starvation of civilians as a method of warfare, willfully killing or murdering, intentionally directing attacks against civilian population, extermination and or murder, and other inhumane acts. But the real objection here is not to equivalency, but to accountability. As Dr. Trita Parsi noted yesterday, quote, Blinken's idea of the rules-based order is clearly an order in which the U.S. rules, not an order where all states, including U.S. allies, are equally subjected to the rules. In fact, the effort to manifest loopholes and jurisdictional arguments that would exclude Israel from the same rule against murdering civilians that we expect to be applied to groups like Hamas triggered State Department spokesman Matt Miller into a shouting match yesterday with reporter Matt Lee. Just watch. Who does have jurisdiction here? So the government of Israel has uh, jurisdiction over we the have, occupied territory. We have jurisdiction over, over Gaza, which is not we entirely. Have, they occupied. have jurisdiction into looking at at uh, the actions okay. by their so military the personnel. Okay. So the Palestinians, if they we, have a complaint, they have to bring it to Israeli we, courts. They, we have jurisdiction, and we ha uh, have uh, with the use of our equipment. I'm sorry. With the, how do you have with the use of our military equipment Matt, that we how, have provided? How do you have jurisdiction? If you look at the Leahy law, if you look at no, that, that's, uh, jur that's not jurisdiction in a criminal process. That's not in a criminal over. process, but it has to do with a. Uh, the determinations that we make and the policies that flow yeah, but from that's it. Not so, but Matt, long term, you were right that we you want to see. You used to work for DOJ, you, Matt. You were Come on. Uh, you, there's, there's no it is, the U.S. It does is not, not have jurisdiction. There are here. different. I wasn't referring to criminal jurisdiction, Matt. There are different ways to look at this. Long term, we agree with you that the Palestinian people should be a state that has the and have the ability to make these determinations. But that's not where right. we are today. That's where we're trying to get to. You heard that right. When it comes to the question of who has jurisdiction over rights for Palestinians. The answer is apparently Israel in the U.S., its greatest oppressor and the oppressor's greatest ally. Keep in mind that one of the foreign policy establishment's main talking points on this, once you get past the whole how dare you hold Israel's crimes to the same standard as Hamas's crimes talking point, is this jurisdictional argument that because Israel is not a signatory to the Rome Statute, which is the treaty that established the International Criminal Court, the ICC doesn't have jurisdiction over Israel and can't issue warrants for Israeli leaders. Now, spokesman Matt Miller argues that the ICC doesn't have jurisdiction over Hamas either because Palestine isn't a state. 
But look what happened when The Intercept's Ryan Grimm pushed Miller on the fact that the Obama administration chose to facilitate the ICC's arrest of an alleged war criminal from the Democratic Republic of the Congo by offering a monetary reward for the arrest, even though the U.S. is not a party to the ICC. At least in 2014, it was the position of the administration that you could even put out a reward for the arrest of somebody that would then go to the ICC and would have jurisdiction. So why does it not that apply to the current Congress? So we have supported the work of the ICC in previous cases. I can't speak to this case because I don't know the fundamentals of it. I don't know the jurisdictional questions. Ult ultimately, um, the main way that the ICC has jurisdiction is if one of the two state parties to a case is a, is a signatory to the Rome Statute and comes in um, uh, under the ICC's jurisdiction. That is not the case here. You have Israel, who, of course, is not a, a um, signatory to the ICC. The Palestinians, who do not represent a state at this time, and so in our view, cannot sign the Rome Statute and become uh, come under the ICC's jurisdiction. I can't speak to other cases. I'd have to look into it in more detail. Here's the thing. Miller is fundamentally misrepresenting America's position. As explained by Craig Mokhyber, former director of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and an expert in international human rights law. Miller is openly lying here. Palestine has been a member of the ICC since 2015. This is yet another case of the U.S. trying to undercut international law on behalf of its oppressive foreign ally. Not to mention that it truly is a sort of rhetorical perversity for the United States to repeatedly vote against Palestine being recognized as a state at the United Nations while using its non-state status as an argument for why an international court should not be able to intervene and protect it from a genocide. Moreover, neither Russia nor Ukraine are signatories to the Rome Statute, but when the ICC issued an arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin for war crimes in Ukraine last March, Biden called the charges, quote, justified, even though the ICC is not recognized by the U.S. Biden told reporters that Putin has, quote, clearly committed war crimes and that the warrant makes a very strong point. The U.S. went so far as to cooperate with the ICC by sharing evidence of Russian war crimes with the court. Members of the U.S. political establishment are claiming Israel is being subjected to a double standard, held to a higher standard than other countries. But if anything, as Mokhyber explains, the charges articulated against Israeli leaders are incomplete and should be supplemented to include crimes of genocide, forcible transfer, unlawful imprisonment, torture as a crime against humanity, sexual violence, disappearance, apartheid, extensive destruction and appropriation, hostage taking, attacks on civilian objects and humanitarians, population transfer, transfer deportation, track, uh, attacking protected buildings, mutilation, denying of quarter, pillaging, poisoning, gassing, prohibited weapons, outrages on dignity, human shielding, and more. But while the experts recommend that these warrants don't go far enough, Many of your elected officials spent yesterday attacking the ICC or seeking, uh, for seeking accountability for Israel, the number one foreign recipient of your U.S. tax dollars. As Florida Representative Brian Mast tweeted yesterday, America doesn't recognize the International Criminal Court, but the court sure as hell will recognize what happens when you target our allies. Hmm. Apparently, the lesson Mast learned from the ICC having to chide Netanyahu for threatening the court just a few weeks ago was just to bully the court harder. So much for respecting law and order. This whole episode is confirming what so many critics of the ICC have always suspected. There is an expectation that the role of international courts is to go after relatively powerless players on the global stage, players who are concentrated in the global south. During her interview with ICC prosecutor on CNN yesterday, Christiane Amanpour drew out this interesting admission. Of course, I've had some elected leaders uh, speak to me and uh, very be, you know, be very blunt. This court is built for Africa and for thugs like Putin, was what one senior leader uh, told me. Um, we don't view it like that. Rules for thee, but not for me. 
instead of respect for a legal authority condemning the murder and abuse of innocent civilians, be they Israeli civilians or Palestinian civilians. American politicians like Republican House Leader Mike Johnson confirmed a vote yesterday to sanction the ICC, which, by the way, is itself a violation of the Rome Statute, intimidation of the courts. As is often the case when it comes to our two-party government, bipartisanship should make you nervous. When Lindsey Graham is complimenting the president, Chuck Schumer, and Secretary Blinken, it's almost guaranteed that they're working together against your interests. While American students are being beaten up in the streets for exercising their First Amendment rights, Ohio Representative Max Miller and Pennsylvania Representative Guy Reschenthaler have introduced a bill to extend military benefits to Americans fighting in the IDF for a foreign country. Hmm. Meanwhile, Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz met with AIPAC leaders yesterday to work with Congress against the ICC decision, a foreign government directly lobbying American politicians to undermine an international criminal court that's scrutinizing their war conduct. Remember that for whatever reason, AIPAC is unique in not having to register under the Foreign Agents Registration Act. The establishment consensus move is to hand-wring about false equivalents, but the real story here isn't about false equivalencies, but about double standards. Israel is repeatedly held up as the exception to laws both international and domestic, a country that gets referred to as a democracy even as it occupies 5 million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza who lack substantive rights and which is shielded from accountability by the United States even when it kills American citizens as they perform their roles as journalists, humanitarian aid workers, or just being a teenager. As editor-in-chief of Current Affairs magazine noted yesterday on Twitter, either Palestine is its own country, in which case Israel is occupying it illegally, or it's part of Israel, in which case Israel forfeits all claim to being a democracy because Palestinians don't have the right to vote in Israel. The problem here isn't that Israel is being unfairly judged as compared to Hamas. It's that more often than not, Israel is shielded from being judged at all. Hmm. So yeah, this whole episode has really exposed the double standard of both our American government and the international community. I think I mentioned on the show before that the ICC has previously been referred to as kind of the um, African cr criminal court because uh, I believe the only prosecutions it's pursued successfully have been against uh, African leaders. And they're, apart from Putin um, and the uh, members of the Global South, it tends to have a handoff approach, which is why people were not surprised when the ICJ seemed to be the one leading the charge here as opposed to the ICC. The fact that the ICC is now pursuing issuing these arrest warrants for both these Hamas leaders and uh, Netanyahu and Gallant is, I think, a demonstration of how bad pub badly uh, public opinion has soured because of just how bad the optics are coming out of Gaza. So look, I understand, I think, the hypocrisy charge, I, I think, is, is fair. I understand it here that, yes, that this is an international body mostly accustomed to, yes, bullying third world countries. I get that. I just don't think, and maybe that's wrong, I, this seems like, and maybe we just we disagree on this. International law or this body in particular doesn't seem like the proper framework to me for adjudicating either the Ukraine Russia conflict or the Israel Hamas conflict. A, a war between two in the in the Ukraine Russia example, two state actors. In this example, a state actor and a quasi unrecognized state actor. Um, where there, this is now an international body saying, yeah, we should arrest the participants in both. I, I mean, I guess sure, but if they if they try to do that, that itself would be a hostile or, or potentially military action, right? Setting off more global conflict. So it just seems seems very unserious to me. But I totally agree with you on people, you know, celebrating it or or saying yes, absolutely. In the case of Putin or in the case of others, should have egg on their faces for saying, well, no, 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 this is illegitimate. So I get that. At the same time, it doesn't seem to me like a productive or useful way to bring to, to really bring any conflict to the end. And in fact, probably when it was done in Russia, it gave, you know it makes Putin feel more emboldened or more isolated or more justified in doing what he's doing, and it might even have the same effect in Israel. So, a couple of points. Just to be clear, if arrest warrants are issued for a target, a global leader in this case, a, a, a national leader, that doesn't mean that 
America or let's say some other signatory of the, the not America, but a signatory of the ICC, yeah. were, gets in a plane, flies to Tel Aviv, knocks down Netanyahu's door and arrests him. What it means is that if Netanyahu were to travel to a country that is a party to the Rome Statute, that he would be subject to arrest. And that has the effect of, yes, isolating Israel um, and embarrassing it on the public stage. So it doesn't mean that you start World War III or you start a, an armed conflict with Israel, but it does mean that there are real implications, some consequences that are being able to put on folks who are not being held accountable within the context of their own country's legal system. And we see this with Putin, that when he tried to go to the BRICS conference in South Africa, uh, I think it was just earlier this year, maybe the end of last year, that because these is warrants had been issued, there was a last minute decision for him not to go because there was a possibility that he could have been arrested in uh, South Africa, which is a kind of embarrassing situation for Putin to be in. And again, I agree with you that this is not yeah, the but way to resolve. Good if he was to be arrested in South Africa, that would be, I think that would be destabilizing for global. Well, he, he wouldn't be because he wouldn't go. But the point well, of the matter a is. Sanction or embargo. Yes, it is. Well, right. I, but, but I tend to oppose those. And the question here is what do you do with when a country, I would argue, is not actually a democracy, where people within their own country are able to get away with war crimes with impunity because there's no accountability mechanism. You have Netanyahu postponing elections and doing what he can to continue this war, arguably, because when it ends, he no longer has the kind of political protection that this national conflict is providing for him. What do you do when it's not just some domestic issue and someone is being tyrannical over their own people, but is actually doing what the ICJ has described as plausibly a genocide, and in a period of seven short months has killed upward of 35,000 people, three quarters of whom are women and children, and displaced basically the entire population of 2.3 million people, destroyed every school, every hospital, um, dug up grave sites, et cetera. What do you do to stop it? What can the international community do? Now, the problem is that one of the biggest tools in the international toolkit is the UN, which is hamstrung by the fact of the uh, America having a veto in the Security Council. So that is why we have turned to some of these other opportunities, as meager as they are, as as minor as it is for Netanyahu and Yoav Gallant not to be able to travel, when that's all that's been left available to you, frankly, because of America's complicity in what Israel is doing in Gaza, I think it's fair to want to use that tool as one in your handbook. And I think it is significant if you're someone like Netanyahu, who, who travels to Europe frequently, who has a relationship with the international community, who is the leader of a country, to no longer be able to travel anymore to much of the world because you have been charged as a war criminal to shift the public perception of Israel as a democracy to a country that is extremely right wing and is run by someone who's been charged and convicted by an international criminal court that is respected as someone who has committed these heinous crimes that are on par with the crimes that uh, Hamas has been accused of. There are overlapping items they have been charged with on that list. And that is something that should embarrass Israel a great deal because unlike Hamas, the world doesn't hold, um, the world does hold Israel out as above that. And I think the point of this is to have a reckoning with whether or not Israel's reputation as our partner in democracy and Western values and all of these things um, should hold up. More rising right after this.